last time I was here, Rwanda Air had one aeroplane in the 1990s. Now there's an airport full, Kigali, Rwanda. Behind me, over my shoulder, is not the French Riviera, the Italian Isles, or the Greek Isles, or even the Whitsundays, as beautiful, lush and tropical green as it is. This is Rwanda. This is Lake Kivu on the border between Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo and over there in the distance we even see one of Congo's many, many volcanoes. This is an astonishingly beautiful country and to many people in the West when you say the name Rwanda words like violence, killing and genocide come up. But did you know that Rwanda was listed by the World Economic Forum as the ninth safest country in the world? because many people in Europe have a view of Africa and a view of Rwanda that's 25 years out of date. This is an astonishingly beautiful country. It's an incredibly safe country. And for me, it's a real emotional trip down memory lane to come and visit this country. Because 20 years ago today, I worked here for the Red Cross, dealing with the violence in the aftermath of the genocide. There were 800 civilian deaths each week from genocidal attacks coming across the border from the inter Humway. And whilst some people have issues with human rights in the current climate here, you've got to remember this. Freedom of expression in Rwanda is what allowed the inter Humway militia through Radio Milkalines to inspire the genocide. I'm here in the Kigali Genocide Memorial. And here, and on a number of levels above, Underneath these concrete slabs lie the remains of 250,000 victims of the genocide. I was here in 1999 as the last slab was laid on top of these bodies. Then this whole mountainside was just red dust. Now it is an incredibly sombre and very well done memorial to the genocide. Unlike many other genocide memorials that I've been to in Cambodia, and former Yugoslavia and Germany. This genocide memorial does two things very well. One, it commemorates all the other genocides that have taken place in the world. But secondly, it tells lots of stories about children. Wasted lives, they call it. Four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds. Their photos, their last words when known, their characteristics, their last memories when known are all commemorated up here. And when you come here you remember how fragile society and community is. Genocide is organised by government but committed by a people. And it's when you come here that you recognise how you must measure Rwanda in how it's recovering and how it needs to recover and what a great job it's done so far. I'm standing here inside of Nyatarama Church. This, like many other genocidal sites, is where thousands of people met their deaths. When I came here 20 years ago, there was three and a half thousand rotting human corpses on the floor here. The smell of this place has never left my soul from the moment I first set foot and looked inside the windows of this church through there. It's clean now. But there are the skulls and the coffins to remind you that this is a place where people died. Genocide is something that marks this country, but is not something that this country should be known or remembered for solely. It is a, a genocide is something that this country is known and remembered for, but Rwanda is much more than genocide. Although the way that these unnecessary deaths are commemorated is something special. Welcome to the Nyuenge State Forest in southwestern Rwanda. I was last here 20 years ago and what a difference 20 years makes. Now why was I here 20 years ago? Modern geographers realised the geographers of the 1800s were wrong. The source of the River Nile wasn't at Ripon Falls outside Kampala in Uganda. In fact the furthest point of the furthest tributary to the River Nile is here in southwestern Rwanda. The southernmost point is down in Burundi, but the furthest point from their mouth is here. In 2006, a group of activists came here and found their way to the source, claimed themselves to be the first white people to see the source of the River Nile. 
but they're wrong. Because in 1999, Rick Orth, the American military attache here in Rwanda at the time, and me, had a few too many beers and decided we were going to find the source of the Nile. And in 1999, we did. We came here. One of the great differences is between then and now is security. Rwanda now is ranked as the ninth safest country in the world. Back then, it was still incredibly unsafe. And this forest was controlled by the inter Hamwe militia, the people who perpetrated that genocide. Today, rather than having to drive down a dirt road and bash our way through virgin jungle, which we did, they even have a visitor's center and marked hiking trails. To come to the source of the Nile in 1999, Rick Orth and I had to have weapons, an armoured vehicle, we had to break all the security rules, and we had to have soldiers protecting us. Today, I come in in the hire car, walk into a tourist lodge, and there are marked trails with coffee. One of the things that has annoyed me a little bit about this trip to Rwanda has been the response to a lot of my friends who have said, be careful, it's not safe. And Rwanda is a really good example of how Americans, Europeans, Australians have a view of Africa that's 20 years out of date, to put it politely. Yes, in the mid 90s and the late 90s, Rwanda was unsafe. But today, Rwanda is entirely safe to come and visit. And my friend Eric is about to bring me some lamb this is Eric. Eric works at the Nyuenge uh, Hotel here, which welcomes visitors and guests from all around the world. The Nyuenge Forest here is one of the oldest forests in the world. Yeah. It's over 100,000 years old. It was part of the only uh, part in Africa where green stayed during the last ice age. So this forest actually dates back older than the ice ages. Exactly. So and you, how does uh, your coffee? I see just I have served you coffee mm -hmm. and also a uh, nice meal. Yep. Uh, how do you just uh, uh, feeling it? I am really enjoying the, the coffee and the beef because it's, it's so different. And, you know, when I lived here in the 1990s, yeah. you had goat and you had chicken one day a week. Exactly. But now I had this beautiful meal last night. Yeah. I'm having a beautiful meal now. The coffee is good because Rwandan coffee is some of the finest coffee in the world. Beautiful mountain coffee beans roasted fresh here. It's for a Melbourne person, huh? It's good coffee. Um, so I can only speak very highly of Rwanda. Yeah, it's, uh, now Rwanda is just in, soon. It will become the like a paradise. Yes. Exactly. Yes. I mean, look, it already is a paradise. Beautiful yeah, a green beautiful jungle. Trees, beautiful dust jungles. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I Thank you, me. Eric. Thank you very much. And uh, as I learned last time, I guess you can Exactly. 20 years ago, along this quiet suburban Kigali street, in this house here, I lived. And boy, are things different. For a start, we have a bitumen road and a footpath. And across the road was a slum area where these four little children lived and used to welcome me home with a salute every afternoon. You know, it's the little things that are getting me. It's the footpaths, it's the street, it's the bitumen, it's the economic development. And you should see what's being built on top of the hill. Welcome to the poolside of Hotel Milkaline in Kigali, Rwanda. This is the hotel made famous in the movie Hotel Rwanda for saving over 1,200 people during the genocide. I'm not going to pretend that three-day visit to Rwanda gives you a comprehensive understanding of what it's like today, but I will tell you this, compared to 20 years ago, it's astonishing. It's incredible progress, economic development, the security and safety of the place, which is paramount. Remember, a million people died in 100 days in 1994. For those who criticize the current government for not allowing freedom of expression, I would say this. If you allow freedom of expression before you have a community's understanding of responsibility to ensure that that expression doesn't create violence, hatred and intolerance, it creates violence, hatred and intolerance. And at the extreme end, that results in genocide as it did here 25 years ago, 24 years ago. What I now see is a very well-regulated country. 
the cars stick in their lanes, their moto taxis are licensed and regulated, people follow the red lights. So you get the sense that this is a country well on the way to full recovery post-genocide and probably in a better position than it's ever been. Economic growth, sure, there is inconsistent growth between the rural and the urban areas, but it's astonishing what's happening here. The thing that I noticed that isn't around is street kids. Now, I have a 20 Rwandan franc coin given to me by a street kid back in 1998, and if you want to know the full story of that, ask me at some stage. I've only seen two street children in my entire visit here, and they were both female and both surrounded by women asking them if they were safe, okay, and if they needed a place to stay. So clearly, this is a country that is working on looking after its most vulnerable and looking at getting as much economic growth across the spectrum as it can. General Kagami said to me on my last day in Rwanda in 1998 and 1999, I want reconciliation between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And I said, cut the crap, sir. What do you really want to do? And he said, you keep forgetting, Andrew, there were three genocides last century. He said, if I don't get reconciliation, there'll be a fourth genocide. I'm Tutsi, my children are Tutsi, my children will die. That's why I need reconciliation. And I'm completely sold by that. If they didn't do something different, if they didn't try to be able to remove the Hutu Tutsi definition, then there would have been another genocide. In many ways, we're overdue. So it's not as simple to say, you don't have human rights. It's not as simple to say there's not freedom of expression because what this country needs is multiple generations of peace. And so far since I've left, there's been one generation of peace. And one of the things that I'm seeing here compared to 20 years ago, the basic stuff that's making me happy, the footpaths on the road, the bitumen on the road, the house that I had in Kigali was on a dirt mud track that was bogged down all winter when the rains came through, but not now. When I was here 20 years ago, there was one set of traffic lights back then. Now there are many, and I don't mind getting caught in the traffic jam behind the traffic lights because it says something about normality returning to this country. The economic growth that you see is astonishing. The peace that you see is astonishing. The beauty of the place is astonishing. For me, this is a real emotional trip down memory lane, but also extremely heartening to see how this country has recovered. Rwanda, after the genocide.